Tonight's lecture concerns microbe diversification, and our learning objectives are to be able to describe what bacteria are. We will also contrast the beneficial versus disease-causing roles of bacteria, including the evolved resistance to drugs. We will compare and contrast the features of archaea with bacteria and eukaryotes. We will also describe the features of protists and differentiate between the three major groups of protists. We will explain why viruses are non-living, and we will discuss the concerns with viruses being able to cross species boundaries to cause infection. The word microbe means small life. It is a descriptive but sloppy name because we could apply the label microbe to any one of the many different types of organisms too small to see without magnification. It is hard to generalize about microbes. They are grouped together simply because they are small, not because they all share a recent common ancestor. In fact, microbes occur in all three domains of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, and so the various types of microbes could not be more widely separated. In this chapter, we focus on the tiny organisms from each of these domains. The microbes in the domain bacteria and archaea are prokaryotic, although archaea have some characteristics like those of bacteria and some characteristics like those of eukaryotes. Protists are the mostly microbial members of the domain eukarya, and viruses, another type of microbe, are not classified into any domain at all because they are only at the borderline of life. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 15.1. Microbes are grouped together not because of evolutionary relatedness, but because they are very small. Microbes occur in all three domains of life and also include viruses, which are not classified in any of the domains. Moving on, humans are large organisms and our size comes with some baggage. We need a skeletal system to support our weight and a respiratory system to take in oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide. We need a circulatory system to move oxygen, carbon dioxide, and other molecules around our bodies and a digestive system to take in food and break it down. We even need a nervous system so that our brain knows what distant parts of our body are doing. Because of their small size, microbes, the most abundant organisms on earth, do not need these types of systems. Take an amoeba a single-celled organism whose volume is about a million billion times smaller than that of a human. At that size, the force of gravity is trivial, so the amoeba needs no skeleton to support it. Plenty of oxygen diffuses inward across its cell membrane, and carbon dioxide diffuses outward, so an amoeba does not need a respiratory system. And because every part of its interior is close to the body surface, it doesn't need a circulatory system to transport gases. Most microbes are even smaller than an amoeba. A typical bacterium or archaeon is about 1,000 million billion times smaller than a human, and an influenza virus is about 1,000 billion trillion times smaller than a human. That's 10 to the 24th. So... Even though they may be invisible to the human eye, microbes are highly successful organisms. 1. Microbes are genetically diverse. More than 500,000 kinds of microbes have been identified by their unique nucleotide sequences, and scientists expect that further studies will distinguish millions of additional microbial species. 2. Microbial species live in almost every habitat on Earth, and they can eat almost anything. As you listen to this, eat something. Some of the bacteria in your mouth and intestine compete with you. 
digesting some of your food before you can, and others use the waste products you release after you have broken down the food. Still others feed on the leftovers released by the breakdown of your cells during the normal process of cell renewal. Microbes living in the human body have a relatively moderate environment. Other microbes inhabit some of the most extreme environments on Earth, in almost boiling water of hot springs, in the frozen soils at depths of a mile below the Earth's surface, and at sites more than a mile deep in the oceans, where the pressure is 200 times greater than that at sea level. 3. Microbes are abundant. More than 100,000 bacterial cells per meter team at the ocean surface, and diatoms, which are protists in the eukarya domain, are equally abundant. These densities translate to about 8,000 million billion trillion, or 8 times 10 to the 30th individuals, of just these two kinds of microbes in the world's oceans. Your own body contains about 68 trillion cells, but only 30 trillion of those cells are human cells. The remaining 38 trillion cells are microbes that live in and on you. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 15.2. Microbes are very small, simple organisms that can live anywhere from moderate to extreme environments. There are millions of different kinds of microbes on Earth in enormous numbers. Moving on, a bacterium has a simple structure. It has a cell envelope consisting of a plasma membrane and usually a cell wall that maintains conditions inside the cell that are different from conditions outside. The cell envelope surrounds a cytoplasm, the substance that fills all kinds of cells, including your own. Bacteria are prokaryotes because they have no organelles. Proteins in the cytoplasm carry out essential functions such as digesting molecules of food and transferring the energy gain to ATP. DNA in the cytoplasm carries the instructions for making those proteins, and messenger RNAs carry this information to ribosomes where the proteins are synthesized. That's all a bacterium needs. Bacteria may be classified by their shape. Some are spherical cells, known as cocci, some are rod-shaped, known as bacilli, and others are spiral-shaped, known as spirilla. Bacteria usually reproduce by binary fission. As bacterial cells divide, the number of cells doubles every generation producing a colony of cells, each of which is a clone of the original cell. Within a few hours, a single cell can form a culture containing thousands of cells. Colonies of different species of bacteria look different. The familiar human intestinal bacteria, Escheria coli, or E. coli, for example, forms beige or gray colonies that have smooth margins and a shiny mucus-like covering. Species of Proteus, which are often responsible for spoiling food because they can grow at refrigerator temperatures, form colonies with the surface that looks like a contour map. So microbiologists can often identify bacteria simply by looking at the colors and shapes of their colonies. They can get additional information by examining a single cell under a microscope. However, Living bacterial cells are transparent, so you can't see them with an ordinary microscope unless they have been dyed. In 1884, Hans Christian Graham, a Danish microbiologist, described a method of staining the cell walls of bacteria to make them visible under a microscope. Today, a Graham stain is still the first test microbiologists use when identifying an unknown bacterium. Gram-positive bacteria are colored purple by the stain because their cell walls have a thick layer of a glycoprotein called peptidoglycan. The extensive cross-linked bonds of the long peptidoglycan molecules provide strength to the cell wall. In gram-negative bacteria, the layer of peptidoglycan is thinner and lies beneath an additional membrane, so these cells are not stained by the dye. Penicillin is effective in treating infections by gram-positive bacteria because it interferes with the formation of peptidoglycan crosslinks. 
Penicillin is less effective at killing gram-negative bacteria because it does not pass through the outer membrane that covers the peptidoglycan layer. Many bacteria also have a capsule that lies outside the cell wall. This capsule can restrict the movement of water in and out of the cell and thus allow bacteria to live in dry places, such as on the surface of your skin. For some bacteria, the capsule allows them to bind to solid surfaces such as rocks or to attach to human cells. A bacterium is a rapid reproducer. Most bacteria have generation times of between one and three hours, and some are even shorter. E. coli, for example, has a generation time of 20 minutes under optimal conditions, so a single E. coli cell could give rise to a population of 20 billion cells in less than 12 hours. So bacteria carry genetic information in two structures, the chromosome and plasmids. The chromosome, a circular DNA molecule, carries the genes that provide instructions for the cell's basic life processes. Most bacteria have just one chromosome, but some have more than one. A bacterial chromosome is organized more efficiently than a eukaryotic chromosome in two ways. First, in bacteria, the genes that code for proteins with related functions are often situated next to one another on the chromosome. This organization allows transcription of all the genes together. Second, Almost all the DNA in a bacterial chromosome codes for proteins, so unlike eukaryotes, bacteria do not spend time and energy transcribing mRNA that will not be translated. Plasmids are a second type of information-carrying structure in bacteria. These circular DNA molecules carry genes for specific functions. For example, the strain of E. coli that has sickened patrons of some fast food restaurants carries a virulence plasmid that magnifies the effects of a gene for a sometimes lethal toxin. E. coli strains without this virulence plasma are normal components of the bacterial community of the human intestine. Many bacteria have one or more, and sometimes more than a hundred, plasmids. So, when a bacterium divides, it creates two new daughter cells with each offspring carrying the genetic information that was present in the chromosome of the mother cell. Thus, binary fission transmits genetic information from one bacterial generation to the next. However, bacteria can also transfer genetic information laterally to other individuals within the same generation through conjugation, the process by which one bacterium transfers a copy of some of its genetic information to another bacteria, even when the two bacteria are of different species, and two, transduction, the process that occurs when a kind of virus called a bacteriophage infects a bacterial cell. The virus reproduces inside the bacterial cell, and sometimes inadvertently, the new virus particles contain pieces of the bacterium's DNA in addition to, or instead of, of the viral DNA, and three, transformation, the process by which bacterial cells can scavenge DNA in their environment that has been released by dead bacterial cells. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 15.3. Bacteria are single-celled organisms with no nucleus or organelles. Instead, they have an envelope surrounding cytoplasm that contains DNA, virtually all of which codes for proteins. Bacteria undergo binary fission and divide rapidly, forming colonies. DNA is transferred from one bacterium to another by three different methods. Moving on, one important attribute that makes bacterial diversity possible is that bacteria as a group can metabolize almost anything. Not all bacteria can metabolize everything. Rather, there is a huge variety of bacteria with each type having its own set of metabolic specifications. Some can use energy from light to make their own food, just as plants do. Microbiologists place bacteria into different trophic categories that reflect their metabolic specialization. 
Heterotrophs are organisms that cannot produce their own food and must obtain their energy from other sources. Autotrophs, on the other hand, use energy from sunlight or inorganic compounds. Bacterial heterotrophs, called chemiorganotrophs, consume organic molecules such as carbohydrates. You might see the products of organic feeders when you take a shower. They are responsible for the pink deposits on the shower curtain and other discoloration on the shower tiles. Most of the bacteria that live in and on your body are also organic feeders. As mentioned earlier, some compete with you to metabolize the food you eat. Others digest things you can't digest. Bacterial heterotrophs, called chemolithotrophs, meaning rock feeders, use inorganic molecules such as ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen, and iron as fuel. The most common inorganic feeders are the iron bacteria responsible for the brown stains that form on plumbing fixtures where tap water contains high levels of iron. And sulfur leaves the slimy black deposits that you may find if you lift the stopper out of the drain in your bathroom sink. Autotrophic bacteria that use energy from sunlight contain chlorophyll and use light energy to convert carbon dioxide to glucose by photosynthesis. The gooey green mats that grow on some ponds are a type of photoautotroph called cyanobacteria. So the cyanobacteria living today closely resemble the first photosynthetic organisms that appeared on Earth about 2.6 billion years ago. These organisms could use solar energy to build organic compounds from carbon dioxide, and in the process, they broke down water molecules to release free oxygen. Before cyanobacteria, the Earth's atmosphere consisted almost entirely of nitrogen and carbon dioxide. The accumulation of oxygen released by cyanobacteria is called the oxygen revolution. Oxygen now makes up about 21% of the volume of air, and cyanobacteria still release important quantities of oxygen into the atmosphere. Bacteria can be classified as aerobic or anaerobic, depending on whether they require or do not require oxygen for growth. Although some bacteria, called faculative anaerobes, use oxygen if it is present, but can also switch to anaerobic respiration when oxygen is absent. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 15.4. Some bacteria eat organic molecules, some eat minerals, and still others carry out photosynthesis. About 2.6 billion years ago, photosynthesizing bacteria were responsible for the first appearance of free oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. Moving on, do you like yogurt? You can thank bacteria for its tangy goodness. Lactobacillus acidophilus and several other species of bacteria are added to milk to create yogurt. As the bacterial cells use the lactose, milk sugar, for energy, they produce lactic acid as a byproduct, which reacts with the milk proteins to produce the characteristic taste and texture of yogurt. If you eat yogurt that is labeled as containing quote-unquote live cultures, you are consuming living bacterial cells that may take up residence in your digestive tract and improve your extraction of nutrients from food. Bacteria are also used to produce many other foods, such as cheeses, and they, along with yeast, are used in the production of beer, wine, and vinegar. Hundreds of species of bacteria grow in and on your body. These microbes are called your normal flora. They take up every spot on your body that a disease-causing bacterium could adhere to, and they consume every potential source of nutrition, making it difficult for a disease-causing bacterium to gain a foothold. Thus, maintaining a robust population of these benign bacteria is in your body's first line of defense against infection by harmful bacteria. Probiotic therapy is a method of treating infections by introducing benign bacteria in numbers large enough to swamp the harmful forms. L. acidophilus, which is a normal inhabitant of the human body, is used to treat gastrointestinal upsets such as traveler's diarrhea and urinary tract infections. 
In addition to replicating so vigorously that it crowds out harmful bacteria, L. acidophilus releases lactic acid, which interferes with the growth of other bacteria and prevents them from adhering to the walls of the urinary tract and bladder. More bacteria live and work in one linear centimeter of your lower colon than all the humans who have ever lived. Are we in charge, or are we simply hosts for the bacteria? Neil deGrasse Tyson. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 15.5. If the population of harmless bacteria in your body is dense enough, it will prevent invading harmful bacteria from gaining a foothold. Moving on, the number of pathogenic, that is, disease-causing microbes, is very small compared with the total number of microbial species, but some pathogens kill millions of people annually despite advances in medicine and sanitation. Among bacteria, some species are always pathogenic, such as those that cause cholera, plague, and tuberculosis. Others, however, such as the ones responsible for acne, strep throat, scarlet fever, and flesh-eating, necrotizing fasciitis, are normal parts of the communities of bacteria that live in or on humans. These bacteria in our normal flora become pathogenic only under special circumstances. The cholera epidemic that devastated London in 1854 became a milestone in epidemiology. Epidemiology is the study of the occurrence of disease outbreaks. When Dr. John Snow mapped the patterns of deaths, he identified the Broad Street water pump as the source of infection. When Dr. Snow persuaded the authorities to shut down the pump by removing its handle, the number of new cases of cholera in the area dropped sharply. Cholera epidemics are a continuing threat, especially where sanitation is compromised during war or following a natural disaster. The strains of cholera found in these areas are especially potent. As the bacteria multiply inside their hosts, they cause severe diarrhea with a massive loss of water. Victims of these severe strains of cholera are incapacitated and soon die, but before they die, they release billions of cholera bacteria in diarrhea, an effective strategy for the bacteria which contaminate the water used for drinking or bathing and rapidly infect new hosts. So let's talk about strep. Streptococcus pyogenes and Notice the word streptococcus. So we can tell that this bacteria is spherical just by its name. Streptococcus pyogenes, or S. pyogenes, is a part of the bacterial community of your nose and mouth. Normally it's harmless, but when the population of S. pyogenes is not held in check by competition with other members of the bacterial community, it can become a pathogen. Strep throat is the most common disease caused by S. pyogenes. It produces a severe sore throat and a distinctive red rash of abscesses with white pus at the top of the throat. Some strains of S. pyogenes produce a toxin that is released into the bloodstream and produces a red rash that spreads across the skin, the disease called scarlet fever. Most threatening of all is an infection caused by strains of S. pyogenes that have a toxin that allows them to enter body tissues where they produce necrotizing fasciitis. These strains of S. pyogenes are known by their well-earned name, the flesh-eating bacteria. So to many bacterial species and other microbes, the human genitals and reproductive tract are desirable places to find shelter, nourishment, and opportunities for reproducing and dispersing. Unfortunately, these microbes can cause problems for humans in the form of sexually transmitted diseases or sexually transmitted infections. Sexually transmitted infections, or STIs or STDs, produce symptoms of varying severity ranging from mild to extreme discomfort to sterility or even death. It is estimated that more than 300 million new cases of STIs occur each year worldwide. STIs can be caused by a wide variety of microbial species, bacteria, viruses, fungi, protists, and even by arthropods. The organisms are passed from the mucous membranes of the genitals, anus, and mouth of one person to those of another person during sexual contact. They are also sometimes transmitted by needles used for drug injections. 
Although most STIs are curable with drugs, two characteristics of STIs make them nearly impossible to completely eradicate. One, their symptoms may be mild or absent, causing many people to unwittingly pass on an infection. And two, to prevent reinfection, both partners must be treated simultaneously. Attributes of the microbes themselves further complicate many efforts to eradicate STIs because most microbes have such high reproductive rates, populations of a microbe can evolve quickly and become resistant to existing drugs. The treatment of STIs is one of the most pressing public health issues in the world today. Okay, and that brings us to figure 15.13 on page 456 of your book. This table shows the causes, symptoms, and treatments of the most common STIs. So if we look on the left hand of the figure, we see the cause, which is bacterium, viral, protist, fungus, or arthropod. So let's look at the examples of this. An example of a bacterium that causes an STI is gonorrhea, syphilis, and chlamydia. An example of a viral STI infection is HIV AIDS, genital herpes, and HPV, or the human papilloma virus. Trichomoniasis is a protist that can cause a sexually transmitted infection. Yeast infections are examples of a fungus that can cause an STI. And crab lice, that's an arthropod that is also classified as an STI. And I encourage you to go through this figure on your own time and review the symptoms and treatments for each of these STDs. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 15.7. A small percentage of microbial species are pathogenic. Among these, some always cause disease and others are harmful only under certain conditions. Sexually transmitted infections are caused by a variety of organisms, including bacteria, viruses, protists, fungi, and arthropods. Moving on, penicillin was the first antibiotic to be manufactured and used widely against illness-inducing bacteria. It came into use during World War II and caused a revolution in the care of the wounded. But antibiotic-resistant infections soon appeared, and the number of resistant bacteria has increased rapidly ever since. Now, almost 80 years after the first use of antibiotics, many bacteria are resistant to many or even most antibiotics. In the United States, more people now die of Staphylococcus aureus infections that are resistant to many different antibiotics than die of HIV-AIDS. One example is the so-called methicillin resistance S. aureus or MRSA infection. A few years ago, antibiotic-resistant staph infections were acquired only in hospitals, but now these infections have spread to the community at large. Microbes live everywhere they can and compete for the best places to attach themselves and for the richest sources of food to eat. This competition takes many forms, rapid growth to grab space, superior ability to seize nutrients and starve competitors, and importantly, the production of chemicals to kill other microbes or at least stop them from growing. Microbes can produce antibiotics to help them compete with other microbes, and most of the antibiotics we use today are derived from microbes. Bacteria and other microbes have developed a variety of ways to resist antibiotics. For example, some bacteria pump an antibiotic out of their cells as fast as it enters, so it never reaches a lethal concentration inside the bacterial cell. Other bacteria block its lethal effect with proteins that bind to the antibiotic molecule. And some bacteria have enzymes that break down antibiotic molecules and then use the components as fuel for faster growth and division. Antibiotic resistance within a population of bacteria can spread quickly because many of the genes that code for resistance are found on plasmids. This means that a bacterium carrying a resistance gene can transmit the gene to other bacteria by conjugation. There's no need to wait for natural selection over multiple generations. So when an antibiotic is taken as prescribed, that is, at the time specified on the label and until the pills have been consumed, the population of target bacteria is greatly reduced. 
Some target bacteria may be resistant to the antibiotic, but they are few in number. The growth of these resistant bacteria will be held in check by competition with other types of bacteria. But if you discontinue use of the medication when you start to feel better, but before you have completed the antibiotic treatment as prescribed, many of the target bacterial cells will survive, including the ones that are more resistant to the antibiotic. These resistant cells will be the founders of a new population of bacteria in your body, so the next time you take that drug, it will be ineffective. Even worse, taking antibiotics when they are not needed to treat a viral infection, for example, selects for resistant bacteria without providing any benefit. Antibiotics have no effect on viruses. Moving on, the use of antibiotics in agriculture is another reason for the spread of antibiotic resistance. Low concentrations of antibiotics are routinely added to the feed of cattle, hogs, chickens, and turkeys. This can be beneficial in the short term, promoting growth and minimizing disease in the crowded conditions of commercial meat and milk production. But in the long run, it can have a disastrous consequence as the practice can lead to selection for bacteria resistant to the antibiotics. This, in turn, can lead to the direct spread of antibiotic-resistant bacteria to humans and the transfer of antibiotic-resistant genes into human pathogens. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 15.8. Antibiotic resistance routinely evolves in microbes, and plasma transfer allows an antibiotic-resistant bacterium to pass that resistance to the other bacteria. Excessive use of antibiotics in medicine and agriculture has made several of the most important pathogenic bacteria resistant to every known antibiotic. Moving on, when you look at the micrograph of archaea in figure 15.16 on page 458 of your book, you may find it hard to believe that these organisms are even a little bit different from bacteria, let alone profoundly different. Both archaea and bacteria live as single cells or colonies of cells. Both are surrounded by a plasma membrane, and both have species with flagella that twirl like propellers. In fact, until the 1970s, biologists considered the archaea to be bacteria. Then, emerging technology allowed for comparisons of DNA, which revealed that archaea are as different from bacteria as humans are. Those studies of archaeal nucleotide sequences stimulated other comparisons which identified additional differences among bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. For example, the chemical compositions of the plasma membranes, cell walls, and flagella of archaea are different from those of bacteria and eukarya. A further distinction for members of the eukarya domain is a distinct cell nucleus that is separated from the cytoplasm by a nuclear membrane. Bacteria and archaea have neither a nucleus nor a nuclear membrane. The presence of a nucleus protects the chromosomes of a eukaryotic cell and allows the cell to control what molecules interact with its DNA. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 15.19. Like bacteria, archaea are prokaryotes that lack a distinct cell nucleus and nuclear membrane. But archaea are classified in their own domain. They are significantly different from both bacteria and eukarya in their DNA sequences, as well as in their plasma membranes, cell walls, and flagella. Moving on... Archaea are famous for their ability to live in places where life would seem to be impossible, such as in water around hydrothermal vents that emerge from the seafloor. At 2,000 meters below the surface, the water pressure reaches 200 atmospheres, or almost 3,000 pounds per square inch, and the 400 degrees Celsius water coming from the vent cannot boil. Yet archaea thrive there. Most organisms die at temperatures between 40 degrees and 50 degrees Celsius because their protein molecules are denatured. Equally impressive is the ability of archaea to live in water as acidic as pH 0 or as salty as a saturated sodium chloride solution. These archaea and some bacteria with similar abilities are called extremophiles. In other words, they love extreme conditions. 
the extremophile nature of so many archaea makes it difficult to study them. Consequently, only about one quarter of the identified archaeal species have been cultured in the lab. We know that other species exist because their transfer RNA has been identified in samples taken from the environment, and biologists are confident that thousands, perhaps millions of species of archaea await discovery. Extremophile archaea have important applications in bioengineering and environmental remediation. For example, Thermus aquaticus, an extreme archaeon that lives in the hot springs where the water is nearly boiling, produces an enzyme important in making the polymerase chain reaction possible. This enzyme is now sold for laboratory use under the name TAC polymerase. Far from being destroyed at high temperatures, TAC polymerase works best at 75 degrees Celsius, a temperature at which most human enzymes would simply fall apart. Extremophile archaea and bacteria that thrive at high temperatures and pressures and metabolize toxic substances may have enormous potential for industry. Recent experiments have demonstrated the ability of some archaea to efficiently degrade hydrocarbons, making it possible for them to be used in the removal of sludge that accumulates in oil refinery tanks and potentially in the cleanup of contaminated environments such as oil slicks. However, not all archaea are extremophiles. Many of them live in places you would find comfortable. For example, beans are notorious for their tendency to produce gas in the intestine, but archaea are the culprits. Methane-producing archaea produce an enzyme that targets the carbohydrate bonds in beans that are not broken down very well by any human enzyme. As a result, the archaea in your intestine digest most of these carbohydrates, but in the process of breaking these bonds, they produce gases that, as they escape the digestive system, can cause considerable distress. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 15.10. Many archaea can thrive in extreme physical and chemical conditions. Not all archaea are extremophiles, however. Some live in moderate conditions, including the human intestine. Moving on. For the first two billion years of life on Earth, organisms were extremely small. Bacteria and archaea less than 10 micrometers across, one-eighth of the diameter of a human hair. But in rocks about 1.9 billion years old, we find fossils of new kinds of organisms that are 10 times larger. These organisms, called acrotarchs, a name that can be translated as, quote, confusing old things, unquote, were the first eukaryotes. The larger size is the first thing you notice about these fossil cells, but the internal changes were the basis for the success of the entire eukaryotic lineage, including humans. For the first time in the history of life, cells had internal structures that carried out specific functions. These structures, the cellular organelles, perform the specialized activities that make eukaryotic cells more complex than prokaryotes. The nucleus is an evolutionary innovation that first appeared in protists. Infoldings of the plasma membrane that surrounded the cell probably fused around the DNA, creating a compartment that is separated by a double membrane from the cytoplasm of the cell. Many modern prokaryotes have plasma membranes with complex infoldings that increase the total surface area of the cell and allow better exchange of material between the internal and external environments. Membrane infoldings of this type may also have played a role in endosymbiosis and formation of the first organelles. Subsequently, the first nuclear membranes developed two specializations. They incorporated proteins that controlled the movement of molecules into and out of the nucleus, and they extended outward from the nucleus to form a folded membrane called the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum is the part of the eukaryotic cell where some proteins are assembled. Further development of internal membranes produced the Golgi apparatus where newly synthesized proteins are given some final processing steps and sac-like structures called lysosomes which contain enzymes that break down damaged molecules. Finally, a lineage of protists took in a guest 
a bacterial cell that subsequently became the mitochondrion, the organelle that produces most of the ATP synthesized by a eukaryotic cell. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 15.11. The nucleus is an evolutionary innovation that appeared for the first time in Protus. Additionally, early protists took in a bacterial cell that subsequently became the mitochondrion, an organelle in eukaryotic cells that produces ATP. Moving on, six major lineages of protists have been named, but even that classification does not capture the huge diversity of the group, and some of the best-known protists do not fit into any of the six lineages. Protists include forms that are very much like animals, others that seem a lot like fungi, and still others that look like plants. So first let's look at animal-like protists. Some protists propel themselves quickly around their environment and appear to hunt for prey. These animal-like protists, which include paramecium or ciliates, they get their name from the cilia or the hair-like projections that cover their body surfaces and propel the cells through water. A paramecium feeds by the process of phagocytosis. Cilia in a funnel-shaped structure called the gullet create an inward flow of water that carries bacteria and other small particles of food with it. And that brings us to fungus-like protists. Some protists resemble fungi living as heterotrophs, establishing sheet-like colonies of cells on surfaces such as grout in shower stalls, using spores to reproduce and sometimes producing fruiting bodies. These are the slime molds. They generally spread not by any individual cells moving, but rather by adding new cells at the edges of the colony. You may have seen an irregularly shaped blob of yellow material in a moist, shaded garden. That was probably a plasmodial slime mold. Plasmodial slime molds are oozing masses that flow along a surface engulfing bacteria, fungi, and small bits of organic material as they go. The streaming of a slime mold in its feeding phase is easy to observe with a microscope, and such a slime mold can flow around, over, or through almost anything. It can even flow through a window screen and reassemble itself on the other side. Remarkably, a plasmodial slime mold is a very large single cell but has multiple nuclei. A single cell may cover an area of several square centimeters, all of the nuclei in the cell undergo mitosis simultaneously. And that brings us to the plant-like protists. Other members of the protists grow in water and resemble plants. These include protists referred to colloquially as algae and seaweeds. The term seaweed generally refers to the macroscopic multicellular marine algae, many of which are used as a source of food for humans. And although all are protists, seaweeds encompass several groups that do not share a common multicellular ancestor. These include some red algae and some green algae, from which the land plants most likely evolved, as well as some of the brown algae, such as the giant kelp that grows in water 30 meters deep. The seaweeds, of course, represent species of protists that obviously are not microbial. Brown algae cover large portions of the rocks in the intertidal zone. Giant kelp growing in temperate regions of the North and South Pacific and off the Atlantic coast of South Africa are among the fastest growing organisms on Earth, with some growing as much as 60 meters in a single year. Kelp forests are enormously important in fostering biodiversity. More than 1,000 species of fishes, crustaceans, snails, and mammals make their homes in these marine forests. Sea otters wrap a kelp around their waist when they sleep, and gray whales hide in kelp forests to escape killer whales. Although many protists are unicellular, there are many exceptions. As we've seen, many green and brown algae are multicellular, composed of many different cells and cell types that perform different functions. Some other protists, such as Spirogyra, are colonial living as collections of cells, each of which carry out 
all of its life processes independent of the other cells. So among the plant-like protists are diatoms. Diatoms are unicellular organisms that live in ponds, lakes, and rivers, as well as in the oceans. They are so small that for some species, 30 individuals could be lined up across a width of human hair. A characteristic of the diatoms is that they are enclosed in a shell made of silica. Many species of diatoms float in the water, forming part of the phytoplankton, a collection of microscopic organisms that fix carbon dioxide and release oxygen. The phytoplankton can reach densities of hundreds of thousands of cells per liter, and they account for about one quarter of the photosynthetic production of oxygen on Earth, occupying a critical position in marine food chains. Small fishes and shrimp-like organisms called copepods feed on phytoplankton, and these small predators are eaten by larger predators, which are eaten by still larger predators. Thus, the diversity of life in the marine habitat relies on diatoms and other microbes that make up the phytoplankton. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 15.12. Protists are a diverse group of mostly unicellular eukaryotic organisms and can be animal-like, such as paramecium, fungus-like, like the slime molds, or plant-like, like the giant kelp. Moving on, in Africa, every 30 seconds a child dies of malaria, a disease caused by a parasitic protist called plasmodium that is transmitted by mosquitoes. A parasite is an organism that lives in or on another organism called a host and damages it. Malaria occurs in tropical parts of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and it is common in the eastern Mediterranean as well. Between 350 million and 500 million people have clinical cases of malaria, and about 1 million people die of it each year. Malaria is the leading cause of death for children younger than five years old in sub-Saharan Africa. Neither the incidence of malaria nor the rate of mortality has changed much since plasmodium was identified as the cause of malaria nearly a century ago. The reason for the lack of progress is the changing nature of plasmodium. The human immune system has a difficult time fighting a malarial infection because to survive from one generation to the next, plasmodium parasites go through a series of distinct developmental stages. And as the plasmodium cells change from one stage to another, the parasite produces different cell surface proteins. Plasmodium stays ahead of the human immune system by constantly changing the way it appears to the immune system cells. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 15.13. Some protists are human parasites that cause debilitating diseases. Plasmodium, the protist responsible for malaria, has characteristics that protect it from the human immune system. Moving on, a virus is not a cell and that is why viruses do not fit into any of the three domains of life. A virus particle, called a virion, consists of genetic material inside a container made of protein. Some viruses also contain a few enzymes. That's all there is to a virus. A virus is simply protein and some form of nucleic acid. The protein container is called a capsid, and the genetic material can be either DNA or RNA. Some viruses wrap themselves in a bit of the plasma membrane of the host cell as they are released. A virus of this type is called an enveloped virus. The flu virus is an example. Non-enveloped viruses are enclosed only by a protein container. The virus that causes the common cold is an example of a non-enveloped virus. There is almost nothing inside of the capsid of a virus except for DNA or RNA. A virus particle does not carry out any metabolic processes, and it does not control the inward or outward movement of molecules to make conditions inside the virus particle different from conditions outside. Viruses just wait for a chance to insert their genetic material into a living cell. So we speak of, quote-unquote, catching a cold, but in reality, a virus catches us. Viruses identify the cells that they can infect by 
the specific glycoprotein molecules on the surfaces of those cells. Every cell in your body has glycoprotein molecules that are embedded in the plasma membrane and extend outward. Your immune system uses these proteins to identify the cells as part of you. When viruses find a cell with the appropriate glycoprotein on its surface, they bind to the cell's plasma membrane and insert their genetic material into it. The viral DNA or RNA then takes over the cellular machinery and uses it to produce more viruses. Viruses carry out most activities by hijacking materials and organelles in the host cell. Viral proteins are synthesized in the same way as the host cell proteins. mRNA binds to the cell's ribosomes, and tRNA matches the correct amino acid to each mRNA codon. The mRNA is produced from the virus's DNA or RNA, but all the protein-building machinery comes from the host cell, as does the ATP required to synthesize the new viral protein. So the other types of non-living infectious agents include prions and viroids. Prions are misfolded proteins that form plaques and interfere with normal tissue, usually acquired through ingestion of an infected animal or its body fluids. Prions can cause a variety of degenerative neurological diseases in humans, and we currently have no effective means of fighting them. One of these, called Kurtzfeldt-Jacob disease, or is sometimes referred to as a human form of mad cow disease, this results in dementia, memory loss, and disruption of balance and coordination. Few victims survive more than a year following the appearance of the symptoms. Viroids are short segments of single-stranded RNA that can infect plants, often with harmful effects. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 15.14. A virus is not alive but can carry out some of the functions of living organisms if it infects a cell. A virus takes over the protein-making machinery of the host cell to produce more viral genetic material, that is RNA or DNA, and proteins. The viral proteins and genetic material are assembled into new virus particles and released from the cell. Moving on. Viruses are nearly everywhere. Viruses infect animals and plants and even infect bacteria. Most viruses infect just one species or only a few closely related species and enter only one kind of cell in that species. But some viruses can infect a wide range of hosts. The rabies virus, for example, can infect any mammal. Pet dogs and cats are routinely immunized against it, but wild mammals such as bats, skunks, and raccoons can get rabies. That is why, if you are bitten by one of those wild animals, your treatment includes rabies shots as a precaution. The glycoproteins on the surface of a virus determine which host species the virus can infect and which tissues of the host it can enter. Influenza A, the ones that cause flu outbreaks every year, for example, have two types of glycoproteins that can have different functions. One glycoprotein matches that of the host cell and allows the virus to enter the cell. The other glycoprotein allows the virus particles to get back out of the cell, and these new virus particles can then infect other cells. So influenza A is an example of a virus that can move from one species to another. In fact, all influenza pandemics in the past century began when a bird flu virus infected humans. Here's how species jumping can occur. Viruses that infect birds don't bind well to glycoproteins in human cells, making it difficult for bird flu viruses to infect humans. However, the cells of pigs have glycoproteins that allow both human and bird flu viruses to bind to them. Thus, a pig cell can be infected by a human flu virus and a bird flu virus at the same time. Both influenza viruses are not very careful when they incorporate newly synthesized RNA into new particles. If RNA strands from a human flu virus and a bird flu virus happen to be in a pig cell at the same time, some virus particles released from the cell might include RNA from both the bird virus and the human virus. These influenza viruses are a new strain and they may be able to infect humans. 
approximately 200 species of viruses can infect humans and, among those, about 50 species are capable of epidemic spreading. Viral diseases have been responsible for several worldwide epidemics called pandemics. The influenza pandemic of 1918 to 1919, for example, killed at least 20 million people and possibly as many as 50 million. In the current HIV-AIDS pandemic, more than 75 million people have been infected with about 32 million people who have died from AIDS. Worldwide, close to 1 million people died of AIDS-related illnesses in 2018. So let's be careful here. AIDS is not a virus. HIV is the virus that causes AIDS. So HIV is the virus. AIDS is the syndrome that is caused by the virus. So AIDS is not a virus. It's a syndrome. Other viral diseases, such as the common cold, are not usually serious. Herpes is another common viral infection in humans caused by two related viruses. Oral herpes is an infection near the mouth and can cause cold sores lasting two to three weeks. More than three quarters of all adults in the United States are infected with this virus, with more than 50 million people experiencing outbreaks each year. Genital herpes, a sexually transmitted infection, affects about one in six people between the ages of 14 and 49 in the United States. The viruses causing herpes are present in and released from sores and spread by skin-to-skin -skin contact, but an infected person can also pass on the virus even when he or she has no symptoms. Although a variety of treatments are available for both types of herpes, including antiviral drugs that can reduce the severity and duration of symptoms, there is currently no cure. So DNA viruses have base pair sequences that remain stable over time because the enzymes that replicate the DNA check for errors and correct them during replication. From a health perspective, the fact that DNA viruses do not change rapidly makes it much easier to fight and treat diseases caused by the viruses using vaccines. Vaccination against a DNA virus, such as smallpox, for example, provides years of protection. On the other hand, RNA viruses can change quickly because the enzymes that carry out RNA replication do not have error checking mechanisms. Because the RNA replicating enzymes make errors as they assemble new RNA molecules, RNA viruses are continuously mutating into new forms. The common influenza virus that causes outbreaks of flu every year, for example, is an RNA virus. Flu viruses mutate so fast that the virus changes from one flu season to the next, necessitating the production of different flu vaccines each year. So several times each century, a new variety of influenza causes a pandemic. The 20th century had three major influenza pandemics. In each case, a bird flu virus gained the ability to infect human cells by passing through pigs, and then the virus spread rapidly through the human population worldwide. The deadliest of these pandemics was that of 1918 to 1919 that we mentioned earlier called the Spanish influenza because it seemed to enter Europe through Spain, but its origin remains uncertain. It infected one-third of the world's population and caused at least 50 million deaths. The Asian flu and Hong Kong flu pandemics originated in Asia, as did smaller viral outbreaks such as swine fever in 1976 and severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS in 2002-2003. In 2020, in response to the rapid and widespread of a new virus called coronavirus, most of the world self-isolated itself. Businesses and schools closed, and the healthcare systems were severely overtaxed by the number of COVID-19 cases. Within only a few months, the virus had caused 250,000 deaths, with many more expected. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 15.15. .15. Viruses cause many diseases in humans and other organisms, including plants. Most viruses infect just one or a few species and enter only one kind of cell in that species based on the cell's surface glycoproteins. DNA viruses are relatively stable because DNA replicating enzymes check for errors and correct them during replication. 
However, RNA viruses change quickly because RNA replicating enzymes do not have error checking mechanisms. Moving on, new infectious diseases, some caused by bacteria and others by viruses, emerge quite frequently. Many diseases originate in animals with the microbes that cause them subsequently acquiring the ability to infect humans. One such example is Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, or AIDS. AIDS is caused by the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, which is derived from a strain of the simian immunodeficiency virus, SIV, that jumped from chimpanzees to humans in the early 1900s. HIV has the hallmark qualities that make viral diseases hard to control, plus an additional characteristic of its own. So first, HIV mutates easily. HIV is a retrovirus, an RNA-containing virus that also contains a viral protein called reverse transcriptase, an enzyme that uses a strand of viral RNA as a template to synthesize a strand of DNA. That DNA strand, in turn, is used as a template to make a complementary strand of DNA, and the resulting double-stranded DNA is integrated into the host cell's DNA. From here, the DNA is used by the host cell's machinery to make more viral RNA. Reverse transcriptase is so error-prone, however, that virtually every copy of HIV in an infected individual's body has a different mutation. This enormous genetic variation in the HIV particles circulating in the body of an infected person makes the infection hard to treat. Virus particles with different mutations can have different proteins on their surfaces, and these surface proteins change each time the virus replicates inside a host cell. Each new generation of HIV in the infected individual contains viruses with surface proteins that his or her immune system has never seen. Furthermore, some of the HIV mutations confer resistance to the drugs that are being used to treat the patient, so new drugs must be used. And second, we see HIV attacks white blood cells. All of those problems would apply to any disease caused by a retrovirus, but HIV offers an additional unique challenge. It targets cells in the host's immune system, especially white blood cells, and particularly those that search for and attack invading bacteria or viruses. During the incubation period, which can last for many years, HIV infects white blood cells. New ones are produced to replace those killed by the virus, so the infected person has virtually no symptoms. Nonetheless, HIV is present in the individual's body fluids during the incubation period and can be transmitted to other individuals. HIV testing is used to detect infections during this stage. Each time HIV infects another white blood cell, the reverse transcriptase makes errors in transcribing the RNA to DNA, and eventually one of the mutations allows the virus to bind to the glycoprotein on the surface of a specialized type of white blood cell, a bacteria and virus hunting white blood cell that is critically important in identifying disease-causing threats. A suitable mutation may occur in a couple of years, though more often it takes about 10 years or longer. But when it does happen, it signals a new stage in the HIV infection, the development of AIDS. The immune system then collapses. Normally, white blood cells all work together to identify and destroy cells that have been infected by a virus. When HIV begins to kill the cells that hunt for viruses and bacteria, the immune system begins to fail. It can no longer respond to HIV or to any other infectious agent. Patients with AIDS develop multiple infections, bacterial and viral, as well as cancers, because they have lost the immune system cells that would normally have marked infected and cancerous cells for destruction. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 15.16. HIV is especially difficult to control. Mutations change the properties of the retrovirus so that it is hard for the immune system to recognize it, and they produce variants that are resistant to the drugs used to treat the HIV infection. Mm -hmm.